on a clear day July 28, 1929. The premier Lake Victoria steamer SS William McKinnon sailed from the Kisumu port, once known as Port Florence. It sailed to the deep waters near Mufangano Island. Accompanied by a flotilla of military boats, it was the last time that a ship, that had become part of Kenya's history, was making its last voyage. And, with full military honors. As the sun shone brightly, the emetic, as SS William McKinnon was sarcastically known, was deliberately listed to the left, and slowly it went down to its grave after 30 years of service. While a chapter on steamship engineering had come to an end, the story of this ship has never, and will never die. How the ship was transported on foot from Mombasa to Kisumu, a distance of more than 981 kilometers, has always baffled many. Yet, no other ship that has sailed on the second largest lake in the world has ever achieved such a claim. It is a story of determination, triumph, prowess, and drama. That can only be matched by the building of the Uganda Railway. Forget the much talked about man-eaters of Savo. The transportation of the the Emetic was possibly more lethargic than previously reported. Never before, and never again, did anyone try to transport such a huge cargo, estimated at 60 tons across the African plains, down and up the Rift Valley escarpment, into the lake shore. It all started in 1894 when the British Parliament voted for the placing of two steamers on Lake Victoria. One of the shipbuilders, Sir George Mackenzie, called the Foreign Office to told them he had a ship. A ship that was suitable for the African lake. But, they had no idea how the ship would make it to the middle of Africa. First, the ship had to be transported to the lake, ahead of the completion of the railway. That meant it could not be transported along the proposed rail. Soon, a solution was found. Engineers had to cut down the ship into 3,000 loads, most not exceeding 30 kilograms for the overland transport. Sold at $4,426, the ship was initially packed in boxes and could have stayed in Glasgow until the railway was completed. It was, first, felt that the move would reduce the transport costs from $250 to $10 per ton. But there was an urgency. Plus a general feeling that Swahili porters would carry the load to the interior. Big mistake. By June 1896, the cargo finally arrived in Mombasa. Here, two Scottish mechanics were to accompany the load to a warehouse station at a place called Maziras. At Maziras, a distance of 25 kilometers from Mombasa, they were shocked. Most of the cargo had been abandoned on the route by porters. It was too heavy and bulky than they had bargained for. For the first time, the building of the steamer looked like a distant dream. The search for missing cargo started. It was painful, backbreaking, tortuous, and it took more time than the engineers thought. Gangs of Indian workers who were laying down the railway were hired to look for the missing parts. Finally, they were found. The next challenge was to get the load past Maasai territory towards Uwasi and Gishu. The engineers worried about an imminent attack. It was in Nandi country where the attack happened. And 17 loads disappeared. Another search commenced. By this time, it was clear that the steamer might never be assembled. Desperation was setting in. London, decided to do the unthinkable. Import camels and ox carts from India to transport the remaining load. But then, the Mazrui rebellion broke out and the store at Maziras, where some cargo had been left, was destroyed. Up in Nandi Hills more cargo disappeared after porters left behind by the caravan abandoned it in the bush. But that was not all. Infighting broke in London between transporters Smith Mackenzie, whose porters were now scattered with cargo in the interior, and Boosted and Ridley Company which suggested that they should have used the Tanzania, Tanganyika then, route. After London appointed a Mr. James Martin to supervise the transportation, he was sabotaged by Sclater who was surveying the Nairobi to Mombasa Road. Sclater wanted to showcase his workmanship. He took some of the imported animals for steamship project and more than 1,000 Kamba porters, who had been recruited by Martin, and gave them to the railway surveyors. Finally, London asked Sclater to take over the transportation of SS William McKinnon. By this time, the cargo was strewn across various railway stations. Some were still in Maziras. But in July 1897, even before he started his job, Sclater died. Just as London decided to put things in order the Uganda mutiny of 1897 broke out. 
and one of the casualties was William Scott. The man who had come to assemble the ship, while it was initially thought that the ship would be launched at Port Victoria, where a pier had already been built, it soon became clear that Kisumu was best placed. Finally, after many problems, three more engineers, Macmillan and Brownlee, and a Mr. Richard Grant, arrived in Kisumu. With them were 200 loads of cargo. They then started assembling the parts. Then, Grant left to go and fetch some of the cargo left in Nandi escarpment. When he returned, Macmillan had died. Brownlee was incapacitated. Grant was unlucky too. He went down with malaria. It was not until 1900, that another engineer, Barton Wright, brought the 2,469 loads from Mau Escarpment to the lake. But not everything reached still. It was discovered that one of the caravans across the Nika Desert was scattered by a storm. Some parts were buried. Perhaps, lost. These had to be identified, drawn and cast in a Mombasa workshop. While most of the parts arrived by 1900, the timber and wood cut in Nandi Hills could not be retrieved. This was due to the ranging Nandi Rebellion. Some new timber had to be sought from Uganda. Finally, the engineers put everything together. On October 30, 1900, SS William McKinnon made the initial sale. It was the first steamship in Lake Victoria. It had caused bad blood between communities, engineers, loaders, and everyone. On the previously uncharted waters, the emetic would get stranded in rocks. But it sailed on. Once, during the First World War, it was used as a gunboat. For many years, it was the center of commerce and transport. The flagship of British Empire. But by 1929, SS William McKinnon was tired to sail again. It had to rest. It was a great shame that a ship that had become part of Kenya's early history was sank. And went down with its story. On July 28, 1929, SS William McKinnon made its final sail. With full military honors, it was listed to the left. Slowly, it started to sink. Today, it rests near Mangano Island. But her story lives on. For more of such historical stories, subscribe to our History Works.